The following audio drama is rated PG-13 for parental guidance for children under the age of 13. Violence, language, and adult situations. You know, the stuff that 12-year-olds would love to hear, but shouldn't. May apply. Greetings, Jack, David, and members of the Society. This is your friendly neighborhood, Matt. And um, I guess two things. Uh, first, was just... I don't know. I I just don't know what to say about um, the passing of our colleague, uh, Bill Howig. Um, He'll be really be missed. And uh, it's just, um, don't even know what to say about that. I don't know. It's it's just weird. It's just like, I I feel a need to acknowledge it, but uh, I just can't really put in the words. It's just like how how much he'll be missed and um, how huge of an impact he had on all of us. Second thing I wanted to say was just, I wanted to comment just how amazing it was that when you guys posted the audio drama uh, 8 based off the um, the real life events of um, Prop 8 in California and just how important it was, that story is told and people just need to know it's just like it it doesn't affect anybody else you know people just want to have families and they want to love each other and take care of each other and shouldn't matter who they love I guess that's all it's it's been it's been kind of heavy couple of weeks so um hoping for something maybe a little bit lighter in the future that I can call in about So um, keep on casting, and I'll talk to you guys later. Bye. And welcome to Sonic Society Season 12, Episode 513. I'm your host, flipping through the pages, Jack Ward. And I'm the other host, David Alt. Uh, Jack, um, is this really the right time to be reading? Well, David, I've been poring over my books lately and thinking about all the words that have been written, and most of it lost. Oof. I've always wanted to have a TARDIS so I could go back in time with a photocopier and get to work on the Library of Alexandria. Yes, and we didn't manage to do that when we had the tortoise, after all. <laughs> no. One thing that is not lost, though, is Final Room Productions' latest audio drama classic, Dark Tome. And it is our feature tonight. With thanks to Frederick Greenhalge, it all begins right here on the Sonic Society. Fred Greenhalgh and Bill DeFries present The Dark Tome, Episode 1, Part 1, featuring the story The Devil on the Staircase by Joe Hill. You know that phrase, books are a gateway to the imagination? Well, imagine it was true. Literally true. Yeah, I know. It's the oldest cliche out there. You forget that when you were young, books were like that. No matter where you were, no matter what was going on in the real world, when you opened a book read those words, you could go to other worlds. And if you've forgotten that, if you think imagination is a toy to be locked in a box when the grown-up world comes crashing in with student loans, 30-year mortgages, and retirement accounts, then you must never have heard the legend of the Dark Tome. I mean, I never had either. Not until that May, when I was spending my suspension from school reading to Mr. Gussie in the stale air of Thompson's Memorial Hospital. It was Wilson, but he spoke no longer in a whisper. And I could have fancied that I myself was speaking while he said, You have conquered, and I yield. Yet henceforward art thou also dead, dead to the world and its hopes. In me didst thou exist, and in my death see by this image which is thine own how utterly thou hast murdered thyself. Mr. Gussie? Mr. Gussie! Uh, what? What? What is that crap? Get it out of here! Mr. Gussie, sorry, I I was, uh... Oh, goddamn Edgar Allan Poe. Come on, Cassie, you know I hate that guy. Long-winded and overrated, if you ask me. Could you find the book I told you about? You told me to fetch you, uh... I told you to bring me the Dark 
tome, not that crap. Give me that book. Okay. <clears throat> Mr. Gussie, what are you doing? Uh, what say of conscience grim indeed? I told you, the book I wanted, it would have had gold letters, the spine as smooth and white as my pale Anglo ass. It would look alive. I didn't see any book like that. Gah, what am I paying you for? You're not. I volunteered. Penance? Because you ripped the hair out of that stupid girl. Well, I did but Don't worry. She deserved it. Have you seen the nurse? Good God, are they trying to stab me in here? Nurse! Nurse! You have that clicker right there. Yeah, next you'll tell me I need to get an app to get decent service around here. What did I pay into my pension for, if not to get a little help when I was on my deathbed? You had a surgery, Mr. Gussie. You'll be out of here in a week. Not if they kill me first with this horrible food. Nurse! I've got to go, Mr. Gussie. Where to? You got a date? No. Ah, uh, it's going to be something good. You think I'm going to cover for you again after what you pulled last time? What do you mean? If that nurse says I left early, Miss Pearson will flame me. <laughs> I'm just messing with you. Go on. Get out of here. I got your back. Is everything okay? Tis not. You try to kill me here? <laughs> Excuse me. This grape juice. You try drinking it lately? It's despicable! We'd still be giving you milk if you hadn't snuck coffee brandy into the last carton. Yeah, <laughs> need something to take the edge off, don't I? You won't even give me the good stuff. Bye, Mr. Gussie. Leaving so soon, Cassie. I'm sorry. I got homework to do. Oh? I told her. She read me plenty for the day. She told me one of my favorite stories. William Wilson. <laughs> uh, of course. See you tomorrow, dear. Bye. Have you ever sit in one of these carts? The blankets, I swear, you make them out of sandpaper. And I should know. I worked in the number 10 mill for 30 years. You but of course, I didn't have any homework to do. I'd been kicked out of school for two weeks already. But I didn't go home either. I couldn't. My mom would be with him, drinking, and things got bad when they got drinking. So that left me with Mr. Gussie's bookshop. The spare key was tucked away in the brass bell outside, next to the plexiglass poster of Stephen King's Misery. It was that poster and the strange mummified hand next to it, Mr. Gussie said it was a monkey's, that kept most of the local kids out of that place. They made up stories and dared each other to go in, swipe a book, some said there was a time, maybe 30 years ago, when a kid went in and never came out again. I never believed stories like that. The place was filled with paperback novels, stacks of them, with bone-like creases on their spines, names like Kuntz, Matheson, Bradbury. You'd walk past those, worried Section Z for zombies would fall on your head, Whoa. to get to the antique wooden desk in the back, pull back the creaky leather chair, roll up the thrift shop rug, and lift the trap door. Go down to the basement, where the walls got... wobbly. Cobwebs. Down here, no one ever bothered me. I could have my blanket and curl up with a book and be taken away. There were plenty to choose from. Hardcovers, some with a film of dust you could write your name in, ran near to the ceiling. But there was only one book that really mattered. The Dark Tome. Of course, I already knew about the book. He had told me where to find it with impeccable instructions. I had already picked it up, felt the spine that rumor said was stitched from the skins of murdered babies. I had opened it long enough to read a few words and feel how, as the words parted my lips, the book's lettering faintly glowed, and the must of the basement faded away for the smell of salt from distant seas. Mom and school and Mr. Gussie and that gossipy bitch Kathy Skillings faded into nothingness. Last time I'd opened it, I'd shut it immediately. But now, I was ready. I opened the dark tome. Okay. The Devil on the Staircase by Joe Hill. It goes, I was born in Sully Scale, the child of a common bricklayer. 
the village of my birth, nested in the highest, sharpest ridges, high above Positano, and in the cold spring, the clouds crawled along the streets like a procession of ghosts. It was 820 steps from Sulle Scale to the world below. I know. I walk them again and again with my father, following his tread from our home in the sky and then back again. After his death, I walked them often enough alone. It, it worked! It worked! Holy crap, it worked! There it is. The little village. Uh, what did they call it? Uh, Posse... Posse, uh... Positano. Ah! <laughs> no need to be frightened, little girl. Who, who are you? A boy who used to live in this village. Ah, well, I suppose I'm not a boy anymore. Look at it. The olive orchard, the ocean, the stairs. I knew each step of those stairs very well. What happens now? Will you continue reading, or...? I don't know. It is up to you. I have all the time in the world. Uh, okay. Well, the next bit, it goes... Up and down I walked those stairs carrying freight. Yes. Up and down I walked those stairs carrying freight, until with each step it seemed as if the bones in my knees were being ground up into sharp white splinters. Are you coming with me? What? Okay. The cliffs were mazed with crooked staircases, made from brick in some places, granite in others. Marble here, limestone there, clay tiles and beams of lumber. When there were stairs to build, my father built them. When the steps were washed out by spring rains, it fell to him to repair them. For years he had a donkey to carry his stone. After it fell dead, he had a knee. I hated him, of course. He had his cats, and he sang to them, and poured them saucers of milk, and told them foolish stories, and stroked them in his lap. And when one time I kicked one, I do not remember why, he kicked me to the floor and said not to touch his babies. So I carried his rocks, when I should have been carrying school books, but I cannot pretend I hated him for that. I had no use for school, hated to study, hated to read, felt acutely the stifling heat of the single room schoolhouse, the only good thing in it, my cousin, Lithadora, who read to the little children, sitting on a stool with her back erect, chin lifted high, and her white throat showing. But Antoniello would not listen to reason. He made sure the king would kill Cienzo for his fault and said, Don't stand here at risk of your life, but march off this very instant so that nobody may hear a word new or old of what you have done. A bird in the bush is better than a bird in the cage. Here is money. She's lovely. Yes. I thought so too. I often imagined her throat was as cool as the marble altar in our church, and I wanted to rest my brow upon it as I had the altar. How she read in her low, steady voice, the very voice you dream of calling to you when you're sick, saying you will be healthy again and know only the sweet fever of her body. I could have loved books if I had her to read them to me beside me in the bed. I knew every step of the stairs between Sulescale and Positano. Long flights that descended through canyons and tunnels, bored in limestone past orchards and the ruins of derelict paper mills, past waterfalls and green pools. I walked those stairs when I slept in my dreams. 
The trail my father and I walked most often led past the painted red gate, barring the way to a crooked staircase. I thought those steps led to a private villa and paid the gate no mind until the day I paused on the way down with a load of marble and leaned on it to rest, and it swung open to my touch. My father, he lagged thirty or so stairs behind me. I stepped through the gate onto the landing to see where these stairs led. I saw no villa or vineyard below, only the staircase falling away from me down among the sheerest of sheer cliffs. Uh, uh, Marco will be so pleased to receive Father. this Father! <sighs> Have you ever taken these stairs? How did you open the red gate? When he saw me standing outside the gate, he paled and had my shoulder in an instant. It was open when I got here. Don't they lead all the way down to the sea? No. But it looks as if they go all the way to the bottom. They go farther than that. The gate is always locked. Always. Padre Filio Spirito Santo. Padre Filio Spirito Santo. Padre Filio Spirito Santo. And he stared at me. The whites of his eyes showing. I had never seen him look at me so. Had never thought I would see him afraid of me. Lithodora laughed when I told her and said my father was old and superstitious. She told me that there was a tale that the stairs beyond the painted gate led down to hell. I had walked the mountain a thousand times more than Lithodora and wanted to know how she could know such a story when I myself had never heard any mention of it. She said the old folks never spoke of it, but had written the story down in a history of the region, which I would know if I'd ever read any of the teacher's assignments. I told her I could never concentrate on books when she was in the same room with me. She laughed. But when I tried to touch her throat, she flinched. My fingers brushed her breast instead, and she was angry, and she told me that I needed to wash my hands. Sounds like some boys I know, except today no one would have the decency to wash their hands. Hey, we're on the stairs again. Is that... My father. It's a grisly little moment. Oh, oh. <gasps> uh. Rather than step on the stray cat, my father stepped out into air and fell 50 feet. After that day, I found a more lucrative use for my donkey legs and yardarm shoulders than hauling those horrid tiles. I entered the employ of Don Carlotta, who kept the terraced vineyard in the steeps of Sulescale. I hauled his wine the 800-odd steps to Positano, where it was sold to a rich Saracen, a prince, it was told, dark and slender and more fluent in my language than myself, a clever young man who knew how to read things, musical notes, the stars, a map, a sextant. Once, I stumbled on a flight of brick steps as I was making my way down with the Don's wine, and a strap slipped and the crate on my back struck the cliff wall, and a bottle was smashed. I brought it to the Saracen on the quay. What is this? Your bottle, sir. I slipped on the rocks. Or oh, you drank it, or you should have. That bottle was worth all you make in a month. Pardon, sir. But my wages are considered paid, and consider yourself paid well. <laughs> now go! As he laughed, his white teeth flashed in his black face. I was sober when he laughed at me, but soon enough had a head full of wine. Not Don Carlotta's smooth and peppery red mountain wine, but the cheapest Chianti in the taverna, which I drank with a parcel of unemployed friends. 
Lithodora found me after it was dark, and she stood over me, her dark hair framing her cool, white, beautiful, disgusted, loving face. She said she had the silver I was owed. <laughs> One good, huh? <laughs> what do you mean you have the money? I told Ahmed he had insulted an honest man, and that my family trades in hard labor, not lies. I told him he was lucky that I had not had... Did you call him a friend? A monkey of the desert who knows nothing of Christ the Lord? <laughs> I see you have more use for the silver than you have for me. <laughs> the way that she looked at me then made me ashamed. The way she put the money in front of me made me more ashamed. I almost got up to go after her. Almost. One of my friends asked, Have you heard the Saracen gave your cousin a slave bracelet, a loop of silver bells to wear around her ankle? I suppose in Arab land such gifts are made to every new whore in the harem. You lie! <laughs> Her father would never allow her to accept such a gift from a godless blackamoor. He speaks the truth! The Arab trader is godless no more. Lithodora has taught Ahmed to read Latin. No! <laughs> he claims now to have entered into the light of Christ. He gave the bracelet to her with his full knowledge of her parents as a way to show thanks for introducing him to the grace of our father who art. When my first friend had recovered his breath, he told me... Lithodora climbs the stairs every night to meet with a Saracen in empty shepherd's huts or in the caves. Ah, I heard it's among the ruins of the paper mills. Or sometimes by the roar of the waterfall, wherever they can meet in secret and in such places she is his tutor. And he a firm and most demanding pupil. <laughs> Tell me more of this. He always goes first, and then she ascends the stairs in the dark, wearing the jangling bracelet. When he hears the bells, he lights a candle to show her where he waits to begin the lesson. Perhaps she will teach another lesson tonight. <laughs> <laughs> We're on the cliffs again. What are we doing here? It's cold. I was so drunk. I set out for Lithodora's house with no idea what I meant to do when I got there. I came up behind the cottage where she lived with her parents, thinking I would throw a few stones to wake her and bring her to her window. But as I stole toward the back of the house, I heard a silvery tinkling somewhere above me. She was already on the stairs and climbing into the stars with her white dress swinging from her hips and the bracelet around her ankle so bright in the gloom. My heart thudded, a cask flung down a staircase. Doom, 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 doom. I knew the hills better than anyone, and I ran another way, making a steep climb up crude steps of mud to get ahead of her, then rejoining the main path up to Suleskale. I still had the silver coin the Saracen had given her when she went to him and dishonored me by begging him to pay me the wage I was properly owed. I put his silver in a tin cup I had and slowed to a walk and went along shaking his Judas coin in my old battered mug. Such a pretty ringing it made in the echoing canyons, on the stairs, in the night high above Positano and the crash and sigh of the sea as the tide consummated the desire of water to pound the earth into submission. At last, pausing to catch my breath, I saw a candle flame leap up off in the darkness. It was in a handsome ruin, a place of high granite walls matted with wildflowers and ivy. 
A vast entryway looked into a room with a grass floor and a roof of stars, as if the place had been built not to give shelter from the natural world, but to protect a virgin corner of wilderness from the violation of man. Then again, it seemed a pagan place, the natural setting for an orgy hosted by fawns with their goaty hooves, their flutes, and their furred cocks. So the archway into that private courtyard of weeds and summer green seemed the entrance to a hall awaiting revelers for a private bacchanal. He waited on spread blanket with a bottle of the Dom's wine and some books, and he smiled at the tinkling sound of my approach, but stopped when I came into the light. A block of rough stone already in my free hand. You have come. Yes. No! <laughs> <laughs> You killed him! I did not kill him out of family honor or jealousy. Did not hit him with the stone because he had laid claim to Lithodora's cool white body which he would never offer me. I hit him with the block of stone because I hated his black face. After I stopped hitting him, I sat with him. I think I took his wrist to see if he had a pulse, but after I knew he was dead, I went on holding his hand, listening to the hum of the crickets in the grass, as if he were a small child, my child, who had only drifted off after fighting sleep for a very long time. What brought me out of my stupor was the sweet music of bells coming up the stairs toward us. I leapt up and ran, but Dora was already there, coming through the doorway, and I nearly struck her on my way by. She reached out for me with one of her delicate white hands and said my name, but I did not stop. I took the stairs three at a time, running without thought, but I was not fast enough, and I heard her when she shouted his name once and again. Ahmed! Ahmed! I don't know where I was running. Chuliskale, maybe? Though I knew they would look for me there first, once Lithodora went down the steps and told them what I had done to the Arab. I did not slow down until I was gulping for air, and my chest was filled with fire. And then I leaned against a gate at the side of the path. You know what gate. And it swung open at first touch. I don't want to go down there. But you know it's where the story goes. Besides, I thought no one would look for me here. And I can hide a while. No. No, I thought these stairs will lead to the road and I will head north to Napoli and buy a ticket for a ship headed to the U.S. and take a new name and start a new... No. No. Enough. The truth? I believe the stairs led down into hell. And hell was where I wanted to go. See how the steps are first of white stone? Soon they grow sooty and dark. And see all those other staircases? How they merge with this one? It's quite a mystery. Or it was then. I had walked all the flights of stairs in these hills, except for this one. And I couldn't think for the life of me where those other staircases might be coming from. I remember it quite clearly. The forest around me had been purged by fire in the not-so-far-off past, and I made my descent through stands of scorched, shattered pines, the hillside all blackened and charred, 
only there had been no fire on that part of the hill. Not for as long as I could remember. The breeze carried on it an unmistakable warmth. I began to feel unpleasantly overheated in my clothes. I followed the staircase round a switchback and saw below me a boy sitting on a stone landing. He had a collection of curious wares spread out on a blanket. There was a wind-up tin bird in a cage, a basket of white apples, a dented gold lighter. There was a jar, and in the jar was light. This light would increase in brightness until the landing was lit as if by the rising sun. And then it would collapse into darkness, shrinking to a single point like some impossibly brilliant lightning bug. He smiled to see me. He had golden hair and the most beautiful smile I have ever seen on a child's face. And I was afraid of him. Even before he called out to me by name, I pretended I didn't hear him, pretended he wasn't there, that I didn't see him, walked right past him. He laughed to see me hurrying by. The farther I went, the steeper it got. There seemed to be a light below, as if somewhere beyond the ledge, through the trees, there was a great city on the scale of Roma, a bowl of light like a bed of embers. I could smell food cooking on the breeze. If it was food, that hungry-making perfume of meat charring over flame voices ahead of me, a man speaking warily, perhaps to himself, a long and joyless discourse. Someone else laughing, bad laughter, unhinged and angry. A third man was asking questions. Is a plum sweeter after it has been pushed into the mouth of a virgin to silence her as she is taken? And who will claim the child made from the rotten carcass of the lamb that laid with the lion? only to be eviscerated, and so on. At the next turn in the steps, they finally came into sight. They lined the stairs, half a dozen men nailed onto crosses of blackened pine. I couldn't go on, and for a time, I couldn't go back. It was the cat's one of the men had a cracking skull, a red seeping wound that made a puddle on the stairs, and kittens lapped at it as if it were cream, and he was talking to them in his tired voice. Good kitties, good kitty kitties, drink your fill. Father will always feed you. Father will keep you warm. I did not go close enough to see his face. I returned the way I had come on shaky legs. The boy awaited me with his collection of oddities. Why not sit and rest your sore feet, Kiranis Calvino? I sat down across from him, not because I wanted to, but because that was where my legs gave out. Oh, oh God. My regrets, girl, but God did not enter this place. Would you like a drink of water? No, thank you. Are you worried about taking something from me? No need. I would love to offer you a gift. It's no trouble at all. There was a light in a jar that grew. A single floating point of perfect whiteness growing from a pinprick until it swelled like a balloon. I tried to look at it but felt a pinch of pain in the back of my eyeballs and glanced away. What is that? A little spark stolen from the sun. You can do all sorts of wonderful things with it. You can make a furnace with it. A giant furnace, powerful enough to warm a whole city and light a thousand Edison lights. Look at how bright it gets. You just have to be careful, though. If you smash this and let the spark escape, that same city would disappear in a clap of brightness. 
You can have it if you want. No, I don't want it. No, of course not. That isn't your sort of thing. No matter. Someone will be along later for this, but take something. Anything you want. Are you... Lucifer? Lucifer's an awful old goat who has a pitchfork and hooves and makes people suffer. And I hate suffering. I only want to help people. I give gifts. That's why I'm here. Everyone who walks these stairs before their time gets a gift to welcome them. You look thirsty. Would you like an apple? They're the most beautiful apples. I was thirsty. My throat felt not just sore, but singed, as if I had inhaled smoke recently, and I began to reach for the offered fruit almost reflexively, but then drew my hand back, for I knew the lessons of at least one book. He grinned at me. Are those from the garden? They're from a very old and honorable tree. You will never taste a sweeter fruit, and when you eat it, you'll be filled with ideas. Yes, even one such as you, Kirin Escalvino, who barely learned to read. I don't want it. Everyone will want it. They'll want to eat and eat and be filled with understanding. Why, learning how to speak another language will be just as simple as, oh, learning to build a bomb. Just one bite of an apple away. What about the lighter? You can light anything with a lighter. A cigarette, a pipe, a campfire, imaginations. Revolutions, books, rivers, the sky, another man's soul. The lighter has an enchantment on it. It's tapped into the deepest wells of oil on the planet, and will set fires that will burn for as long as the oil lasts, which I'm sure will be forever. You have nothing I want. I have something for everyone. I rose to my feet, ready to leave, though I had nowhere to go. I couldn't walk back down the stairs. The thought made me dizzy. Neither could I go back up. Lithodora would have returned to the village by now. They would be searching the stairs for me with the torches. I was surprised I hadn't heard them already. But there was one more thing. A mechanical tin bird that turned its head to look at me as I swayed on my heels and blinked. The metal shutters of its eyes snapping closed and popping open again. It let out a rusty cheep. So did I, startled by its sudden movement. I thought it a toy, inanimate. It watched me steadily and I stared back. I had, as a child, always had an interest in ingenious mechanical objects, clockwork people who ran out of their hiding places at the stroke of noon, the woodcutter to chop wood, the maiden to dance around. The boy followed my gaze and smiled, then opened the cage and reached in for it. The bird leaped lightly onto his finger. Ah. This bird sings the most beautiful song. It finds a master, a shoulder it likes to perch on. Sings to this person for the rest of its days. The trick to making it sing is to tell a lie. The bigger the better. Feed it a lie and it will sing to you the most marvelous little tune. People love to hear its song. They love it so much they don't even care they're being lied to. He's yours if you want him. I don't want anything from you. You see? Likes you. Looks rather nice on your shoulder. Uh, I... I can't pay. You've already paid. Then he turned his head and looked down the stairs and seemed to listen. I heard a wind rising. It made a low, soughing moan as it came through the channel of the staircase, a deep and lonely and restless cry. The boy looked back at me. Now go, 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 go. I hear my father coming. That awful old goat. <laughs> I backed away, and my heels struck the stair behind me. I was in such a hurry to get away, I fell sprawling across the granite steps. The bird on my shoulder took off, rising in widening circles through the air. But when I found my feet, it glided down to where it had rested before on my shoulder, 
and I began to run back up the way I had come. I climbed in haste for a time, but soon was tired again and had to slow to a walk. I began to think about what I would say when I reached the main staircase and was discovered. I will confess everything and accept my punishment, whatever that is. I felt silent, though, as I reached the gate, quieted by a different song, not far off. A girl sobs. I listened, confused, and crept uncertainly back to where I had murdered Lithadora's beloved. I heard no sound except for Dora's cries. No men shouting. No feet running on the steps. I had been gone half the night, it seemed to me. But when I reached the ruins where I had left the Saracen and looked upon Dora, it was if only minutes had passed. I came toward her and whispered to her, afraid almost to be heard. The second time I spoke her name, she turned her head and looked at me with red-rimmed, hating eyes and screamed, Get away! I wanted to comfort her, to tell her I was sorry. But when I came close, she sprang to her feet and ran at me, striking me and flaying at my face with her fingernails while she cursed my name. I meant to put my hands on her shoulder to hold her stiff. But when I reached for her, they found her smooth white neck instead. No! You... you... you killed her! Oh, for... Oh, oh. Her father and his fellows and my unemployed friends <laughs> discovered me weeping over her, running my fingers through the silk of her long black hair. Her father fell to his knees and took her in his arms, and for a while the hills rang with her name over and over again. What happened here? The Arab, that monkey from the desert, he did this. He lured her here, and when he couldn't force her innocence from her, he throttled her in the grass. And I found them, and we fought. I killed him with a block of stone. Oh, poor Lithodora. Take faith. We will avenge her. I held Lithodora in my arms as we walked down the steps. As we went on our way, the bird began to sing again. As I told them, the Saracen had planned to take the sweetest and most beautiful girls and auction their white flesh in Araby, <laughs> a more profitable line of trade than selling wine. The bird was now whistling a marching song, and the faces of the men who walked with me were rigid and dark. I always knew they were no good. Yes. We must burn them. Burn them, yes. Burn them. Burn them. Ahmed's men burned, along with the Arab ship, and sank in the harbor. His goods, stored in a warehouse by the quay, were seized, and his money box fell to me as a reward for my heroism. No one ever would have imagined when I was a boy that one day I would be the wealthiest trader on the whole Amalfi Coast, or that I would come to own the prize vineyards of Don Carlotta, I who once worked like a mule for his coin. No one would have guessed that one day I would be the beloved mayor of Suliscala, or a man of such renown that I would be invited to a personal audience with His Holiness the Pope who thanked me for my many well-noted acts of generosity. The springs inside the pretty tin bird wore down in time, and it ceased to sing. But by then, it did not matter if anyone believed my lies or not. Such was my wealth and power 
and fame. However, several years before the tin bird fell silent, I woke one morning in my manor to find it had constructed a nest of wire on my windowsill and filled it with fragile eggs made of bright silver foil. I regarded these eggs with unease, but when I reached to touch them, their mechanical mother nipped at me with her needle-sharp beak, and I did not, after that, make any attempt to disturb them. Months later, the nest was filled with foil tatters. The young of this new species, creatures of a new age, had fluttered on their way. I cannot tell you how many birds of tin and wire and electric current there are in the world now, but I have this very month heard speak of our new Prime Minister, Mr. Mussolini. When he speaks of the greatness of the Italian people and our kinship with our German neighbors, I am quite sure I can hear a tin bird singing with him. Its tune plays especially well, amplified over modern radio. The villa, would you like to come in? No. You see, I don't live in the hills anymore. It has been years since I saw Sulle Scale. I discovered, as I descended at last into my senior years, that I could no longer attempt the staircase. I told people it was my poor, sore old knees. But in truth... I developed a fear of heights. Uh, I'm, I'm back. Uh, ah, what the hell is that? Oh, it's a bird. Uh, oh shit. Oh shit. What oh, the shit. hell did you do, ah, Cassie? You, Mr. Gussie, what the hell are you doing here? Well, it's my bookshop. You're supposed to be in the hospital. I figured you might be getting back to mischief. No boy, no school, no home to go to. You weren't sneaking off to smoke pot with the big kids, were you? No, you were dabbling in something a lot more dangerous. You should have told me. I did tell you. I told you to bring the book to me. Why? So you could escape the hospital? You seem perfectly capable of doing that without the book. No, no. I need it so I can find them. Find... wait, what? No, Mr. Gussie. You need to help me, Cassie. They're gone from this world, but I think with the dark tome, I might be able to find them. I can't do it by myself. Shut up! Shut up, you horrible bird! I don't ever want to open that book again! Ugh. The dark tome doesn't light up for me like it does for you. I guess I've gotten too old. Lost some of the magic. With you, Cassie, we can travel all sorts of places. Come on! Bye, Mr. Gussie. Come on, Cassie! Cassie! I had lost track of time. When I went into Gussie's bookshop, it was maybe four, and now it was full dark. Since it was no longer safe in my hiding place, I figured it couldn't be any worse to go home. My mom would be pissed. Pissed drunk, at least. Mom? Oh. Where have you been? Nowhere, Mom. Don't you lie to me. You smell like you've been hanging out around a campfire. And have you been drinking? You wouldn't believe me if I told you. Oh. No, of course not. Where's Mark? He's out getting pizza, I think. Or that or more vodka. Oh, shit, the bottle! He'll be back in a minute. Why? You got a problem with him? It's not that. Hey, hold on a second. I need to let something in. Ah, uh, sure. <sighs> Whoa! What the fuck is this? It's a mechanical bird, Mom. He came out of hell. I thought you'd get along great with him. The fuck? Try telling it a lie. 
It loves lies. I never lie, Cassie. Not to you, not to anybody. Holy shit, it works. What? Try it again. What are you talking about? Like, talk about your drinking. What drinking? Fuck. Cassie, I told you I'm trying to quit. It really works. It's like I don't even care anymore. Mark hits me, you know. He never hits you. You and that bird, Mom. I think you're going to get along great. You don't know what it's like for me as a person. I didn't sign up to be a single mom. I didn't even want to be a mom in the first place. Wait, that's not what I meant to say. I think it is. Cassie! Cassie, I love you, Cassie. Don't forget that. Everything I do, I'm thinking of you first. Would someone turn that horrible thing off? Ow! I got in my room, and I didn't start crying like I thought I would. Instead, I found myself thinking of the dark tome. I started thinking about Mr. Gussie, and most of all, I started thinking about that damn bird. I closed my eyes, and the sound of those seaside cliffs kept coming back to me. I stared at the ceiling, and the shadows looked like the charred trees on the staircase to hell. I heard cars on the street outside, and I swore beneath them I could hear the laughing song of the mechanical bird. From my window, I could see all of Main Street. From the barbers, to the furniture store, to the unremarkable two-story tenement on the corner. Gussie's. My window overlooked a fire escape, and my mom would be passed out in an hour if she wasn't already. And I didn't care what she had to say anyway. I opened the window, climbed out onto the rusty metal stairs, and headed to Gussie's again. I needed another story. You've been listening to The Dark Tome, Episode 1, Part 2. Come back November 18th, 2016 for the first part of Episode 2, The Bread We Eat in Dreams by Catherine M. Valente. In the meantime, please leave a review on iTunes and tell your friends. We are on social media as The Dark Tome. Also have a website at thedarktome.com. Today's story was The Devil on the Staircase by Joe Hill, adapted for audio by Fred Greenhalge, produced by Fred Greenhalge of Final Rune Productions and Bill Dufries of Mind's Eye Productions, dialogue editing by Grace Waldron, sound design by Rory O'Shea of Smash Sound Studios, cast members Lily Thorne as Cassie, Tim Sample as Mr. Gussie, Brent Ascari as the narrator, Ian Carlson as man, Jalen Wisey as boy, Anna Gravel as Lithodora, Marie Stewart Harmon as nurse, Christine Marshall as mom, Eric Moody and Jay Piscopo as bar friends and soldiers, Tom Alexander as voice in hell. Original score, February by Peter Van Riet. The Dark Tome is part of Wondery, a network of storytellers. Be sure to check out our sister podcasts, The Cleansed and Radio Drama Revival, also on Wondery. The Dark Tome is a co-production of Final Rune and Mind's Eye Productions. Learn more at thedarktome.com. And that's this week's show. See you next week for an island adventure. The Coral Island Adventures, to be exact. And please send us your thoughts and impressions through the email. That's impressions of anything. It could be of me and Jack, if you wanted. <laughs> at sonicsociety at gmail.com, Twitter, or the Facebook groups, either Sonic Society or Audio Drama Radio Drama Lovers. So until next Tuesday, I'm David Alt. And I'm Jack Ward. Good night. Good night. <laughs> Sonic Society is written and produced weekly by Jack J. Ward and David Alt, with original music by Sharon B. at SharonB.com. All features, interviews, and audio drama shorts are owned completely by their originators and provided to the Sonic Society by Creative Commons Licensing. The Society itself originates from Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada. Thanks for listening.
This has been an Electric Vicuna production. <laughs>